Hello everyone, good evening. So we're now in week 11. We've only got one more week to go and uh, the course is going to be officially over. So welcome again and uh, thanks for joining tonight's tutorial. I see the same usual phases. So welcome again. Uh, now before we, talk, we start talking about tonight's topic, I'd like to point out that I'm gonna stay on for about 30 minutes or more after tonight's tutorial, just in case there's some of you who would like to have his or her paper informally reviewed. Now, ordinarily, when it comes to an informal review, what I simply do, or what Samantha would do, would actually be to just go over your paper to tell you then whether there is scope for a possible ad upward adjustment in your mark. Now, I'm not able to do an informal review of the papers uh, that were marked by Samantha, but I would be prepared to do an informal review uh, of the papers which I personally marked. So as I said, in an informal review, what I would typically do is just to say whether or not there is scope for an upward adjustment and nothing more. I will not be providing further feedback. However, for tonight's session, as well as uh, a special session I could do on Monday of next week, I am prepared to go over the paper of a student and provide further feedback to what is already on the paper. But for me to do that, that, uh, that session will have to be recorded and we should be visible to everybody else because that will have to be used as a learning opportunity. So if the, if the student seeks to you know, get further feedback from me, we can do so in the context of that special session, which I said will be publicly visible to everybody because it will be a learning session. Now, on the other hand, if all you really need is an informal, an informal review, whether or not, you know, for you to determine whether or not there is a likelihood that your grade or your mic might be increased, uh, that can be done, but there will be no feed, further feedback that will be given. It's simply me or Samantha telling you that there is scope for your paper to possibly uh, be marked uh, higher. Okay, so is that clear? So after this session, I'll be free to you know stay on. And uh, if you want your if you want to get further feedback from me, stay on, and we will go through your paper. And I'd be more than happy to provide that feedback. Okay, any questions, comments? Um, yes, name Joe. Janet. Janet. Yes. Hello, Janet. I was just wondering. I can't stay beyond this because I've got another um, tutorial immediately after. Yes. So I have to exit at seven. Um, I can't attend the one on Tuesday, next Tuesday the 4th, because that's when I've got my moot session, oh, okay. um, which is an assessment. So what is the scope in between that for, is it best if I just send you an email? Uh, in relation to what? Uh, the assignment. You, you mean the legal memorandum assignment, is that it? That's right, yes. Uh, you want it? So your question is, can you get, can, I, can you ask for an informal review? Was that it? Yes. Can I ask for an informal review? I wanted to find out a little bit more about what you meant by that. Oh, if it's an informal review, all, it, all that will happen is that we will do an informal review. We're going to go through the paper again, review mm -hmm. the sufficient feedback, and then inform the student whether or not there is a likelihood of a mark being increased. That is all. We will not provide okay. any further feedback. No, okay. Uh, if I need to have, a to have uh, further feedback, I'm happy to do that in the context of a learning session, which means that you know any student will be here and we will go over your paper. But as I said, my purpose is not to um, embarrass the student. We're just going to go through the paper, you know, sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph, so that we can see the you know where the areas uh, of improvement uh, are. And so that the student and all the students who go through the uh, lecture recording, or mean the recording, will then have an idea on how to improve his or her future assessment piece. And when would that be? Oh, that's going to be tonight. We're going to have one tonight. And, okay. and I can't attend uh, tonight. We can do that. We can have, have another one on Monday. Mo on Monday? Yes. Uh, between 6 to 7. Monday, 6 to 7. Okay. I'll write that down. Now, that assumes there is someone who would be willing to use his or her paper uh, as an example of be yours. Uh, we can do that. Yes, because as I told you, I'm going to do an informal review of your paper. So we can do that on Monday. Fantastic. Okay. 
Fantastic. And it'll be on the same Zoom number and everything. Great. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments, questions? So we're good. Okay. So tonight we're covering the final topic on constitutional law, which is about constitutional rights and freedoms. And if there is any topic that is most relevant to us as citizens, it is this topic on constitutional rights and freedoms because it affects us directly. All the other topics on um, the, the tension between the Commonwealth and the states or across the uh, different branches of government, they don't really affect us directly, but when it comes to constitutional rights and freedoms, they certainly do because we're speaking of our rights and our freedoms. So th this is a topic that uh, should be close to our hearts. Okay, so we could proceed. Now, in terms of key outcomes, therefore, after studying this topic, uh, you should be able to discuss. I've got a question. Can you hear me if I just speak this way? You could. Yeah, because I have this tendency to be quite excited and uh, speak in a louder voice. And in fact, I may in fact become, I may, I may in fact be too loud for you. So, yeah. Okay, so after studying this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain the constitutional basis for the rights and freedoms of Australians despite the absence of a bill of rights uh, from tiffany yeah you could in fact adjust the volume on your computer okay you can also discuss and explain the constitutional constraints on governmental powers to interfere with the rights and freedoms of australians discuss and explain the implied freedom of political communication and freedom from arbitrary detention and discuss and explain how and why an ex post facto law can be valid in australia so let's begin Discussion question one. The Commonwealth Parliament passed the Border Protection Security Act 2013 Commonwealth, making it an offense for an Australian citizen to engage in terrorism as defined by the Act abroad or in Australia. The Act also penalizes acts of terrorism, even if done prior to the coming into effect of the Border Protection Security Act 2013. Alan Lambert, an Australian citizen, was charged under the Act for engaging in terrorism with Jamaa Islamiyah, a named, te named terrorist organization in Syria in 2010. Lambert seeks to challenge the law on the ground that he cannot be held criminally liable for an act that occurred outside of Australia. He also challenges the law as an ex post facto law that punishes acts that were legal at the time they were done. Advice Lambert on whether his legal challenge is likely to prosper. Volunteers. I'll have a go, Manjo. Brad, thank you, Brad. Yeah, that's all right. Um, in, in the um, <coughs> Okay. In the case of the Poly Yukovic, um, they they talk through crime. Uh, so the, they talk through the crimes that have occurred overseas, and that I think it's Section Nine mm -hmm. of the Constitution mm -hmm. allows um, them to make such laws. Mm. But under the um, the doctrine of the separation of powers, mm. um, the judiciary is still the one which would then decide upon whether um, the con uh, whether the constitution had the power um, to bring about that um, charge under the legislation. Okay. So they can have the legislation, but it's still up to the judiciary to make a decision as to whether the person could be found guilty of that charge. Okay. So, in answer to this question, how will you advise Lambert? Um, get a good barrister. <laughs> <laughs> An expensive one. Um, yeah. But, I mean, effectively, it's the same as the Poly Yukovic that, um, and, and, it, and I think it talks in that question, does it, about um, the, um, 
the terrorism as as defined under the Act. Mm -hmm. So I guess it would come down as to whether um, his uh, engaging in terror. Well, it says he's engaging in terrorism with Jamai Islamia. Mm -hmm. We can only assume that he does satisfy an act of terrorism as defined by the Act. Okay. We assume that, I guess, from the question because we don't have all the details. Okay. Okay, I've got a general question. When we have a problem-based question like this, what is the first thing we need to do? Find the issue. Very good. Okay, so we need to define the legal issue. What exactly is or are the legal issues here? Um, the starting point. Well, the first one would be whether the, the Act is constitutionally valid. Okay, but that's too broad. Too broad, okay. Um, so, I mean, obviously that's, that's all we need to know. But remember, what, what is the purpose of defining the legal issue? If you define the legal issue, you can okay. then identify the relevant rules that will inform the legal issue. Can, uh, so the okay, can Lam yes, okay. Is, um, can Lambert be charged with an offense, a criminal offence that occurred outside of Australia? Okay, and so why is that a legal issue? What's the legal issue there? Out, being outside of Australia. Okay, so uh, it's a question of um, being charged. Can he be criminally liable? Can he be criminally liable for an offence uh, that committed. was allegedly committed Led, yeah. outside of Australia? Okay. That's good. Prior to this, what is the other legal issue that's basic before we can even talk about this? What is that? Um, oh, um, um, can, can, can the act um, so it was a retrospective. So we're talking um, whether um, um, whether it can be um, charged with an offence on an act retrospective. Okay. So the other aspect is, of course, as pointed out here by B, is the Commonwealth Parliament able to pass an ex post facto law? So I'm just going to copy and paste that. Yeah. Thank, thanks, B. Very good. Okay. But we're missing something here. We're missing something here. So there is a um, issue here identified by B. Okay. Which is related to the first one that Brad has already identified, but that's quite similar. Is the Commonwealth Parliament able to pass legislation which applies extraterritoriality? That's the same. What is the other key issue here? That he's an Australian citizen? No. Uh It's actually related. The, the basic question, the basic question that needs to be determined here is whether or not the Australian Parliament actually has the power. So this time we said about criminal liability. It is the power of the Australian Parliament to pass legislation criminalizing behavior abroad. Okay, that those are two different things because uh, on the one hand. We're simply looking at the issue of extraterritoriality, extra but the other issue really is it's the power of the Commonwealth Parliament. So perhaps the, the point raised here by B is probably more correct. Is the Commonwealth Parliament able to pass legislation which applies extraterritoriality? I would, I, I would think that um, the issue as identified by B is uh, better phrased. Okay, so thank you, B. Okay, would, would everyone agree that uh, these would be the two crucial legal issues? Yes? Yes? So, we're, so the focus is, is not just a question of determining whether or not there could be criminal liability on the part of an Australian committing an alleged crime outside of Australia. The focus in that sense is constitutional rights and freedoms, correct? 
if the question is about criminal liability for an alleged crime outside of Australia, the focus is on constitutional rights and freedoms. But actually, before you talk about constitutional rights and freedoms, you need to talk about the power of the Commonwealth Parliament to legislate in relation to actions or alleged offenses occurring outside of Australia. They are definitely related, but they are two different things. Uh, would you agree? I think you would. Okay, good. So, having said that, so in other words, you do that because if you start talking about the issue about extraterritoriality and the issue about constitutional rights and freedoms, you are missing the point. You're jumping the gun before you can even argue that you know um, it's within the it, it's that there is no such thing, for example, as um, ex post facto laws. Uh, that ex post facto laws are permissible in Australia. You actually need to go back to the question of whether or not the Commonwealth Parliament has the power in the first place to legislate on a specific subject matter. So let's begin with that. Is the Commonwealth Parliament able to pass legislation which applies extraterritoriality? Let's begin with that. What's the answer? Okay, good. Um, we've got an answer here from B. Yes, according to the External Affairs Power, Section 51, Paragraph uh, 29 of the Australian Constitution. Very good. Very good, Brad. Thank you. Now, so we're clear about that. So before you start talking about constitutional rights and freedoms, as a reminder, you better make sure that you're able to address the question if the Commonwealth Parliament has the power in the first place to legislate on that specific area. Okay, now on the other hand, what if this were a, um, a Queensland Parliament, a, uh, rather a, a state legislation? And I wonder if, um, you know, it, it, it could be a question of the Queensland Parliament making it an offense uh, for somebody who resides in, in Queensland to um, commit a crime as defined in Queensland, say in New South Wales. So that's a, a different issue altogether. Okay, but the, the point there is you need to be able to address the legal issue of whether or not that specific parliament, whether the Commonwealth Parliament or the State Parliament, actually has the power to legislate on that subject. Okay, so here we understand it's going to be Section 51, uh, Paragraph 29 or Subsection 29. Okay, so what's the answer here? So I think the issue of applying extraterritoriality, so is that, is that valid? Under the external affairs power? Um, where's the answer here? Can I get some volunteers? I think somebody made a suggestion that I should just call people at random. How about Kasparus Schumann? Kasparus, would you, would you like to, to um, can I volunteer you to answer that question? If it's all right. Is the Commonwealth Parliament able to pass legislation which applies extraterritoriality? No, no. In this case, the, sec the, the other issue now is, um, can the Commonwealth Parliament criminalize behavior occurring outside of Australia? So can the Commonwealth Parliament, so the better question here is, can the Commonwealth Parliament, I'll, I'll fix the spelling in the short one, can the Commonwealth Parliament criminalize behavior occurring outside Australia? Kasparos, do you think you may you may want to try answering that question? Or could I get another volunteer? Jessica? Adam? I'm happy to. Janet? 
Go ahead. Yes, Janet. I'll, I'll have a shot. I haven't got which um, part of the Constitution it is, yep. but I believe that it is within the Constitution that anything that threatens Australia, uh, the federal government under the Constitution has the powers to uh, ensure Australia's safety. So, therefore, for some acts that particularly threaten Australia, um, yes, but I'm sorry, I can't recall offhand the, the actual part of the Constitution that it, that is. Very good. So, in particular, what power of the Commonwealth Parliament was Janet alluding to? Um, the Defence Power, Section uh, 51.6. I was just about to mention that, that whether they could make use of I had it justified under two heads of power. Very good. Uh, from Very external good. and internal enemies as well as external affairs. Very good. So that's a good way of doing it. So um, you cite the power of the Commonwealth Parliament to legislate in, uh, in regard to external affairs, but at the same time, under the power of um, the Commonwealth Parliament to legislate in matters of defence. Very good. Now, there is a constraint as far as use the usage of the defense power of the Commonwealth Parliament is concerned. What exactly are at least two of the constraints there? Would you remember? Uh, it's actually, in Stenhouse and Coleman, the, um, there's a purposive test to the defense power. Very it good. must be uh, directly applicable to the purpose as Very well good. as adapted, proportionate, uh, adap adapted and proportionate. Very good. Very good. So there's the purposive test and there's the question of reasonableness and proportionality. If it is the uh, defense power that is being cited as the basis for a specific legislation. Now, the, the question that arises is when you speak traditionally of defense, you usually speak in the context of foreign enemies, don't you? And well, indeed, uh, but here it says, for an offense abroad or in Australia. So in, in relation, therefore, to criminal behavior in Australia, how can you apply the defense test if traditionally, if traditionally defense relates to a foreign armed invasion or enemies from abroad? How can you justify that? How can that Actually, I, I got it down in my notes as uh, under section 5139, mm -hmm. as well as the uh, executive power under section 61 to preserve mm -hmm. the constitution and protect the people. Uh, that would also cover internal attacks as well as external ones. Okay. Do we remember a specific case on that subject in relation to the use of the defense power? Uh, to quell uh, that, that was, example, yeah. we've committed within Australia that would go against that or would be in line uh, with the defense of Australia. What case is that? Is there any case? Very good. From Karen and Vanessa and Nicholas, Thomas versus Mowbray. So in the case of Thomas versus Mowbray, the High Court has ruled and clarified that the defense power can be used uh, not only in relation to acts committed outside of Australia, but also for domestic terrorism or acts committed within Australia. Very good. Okay, question so far? Now moving on. Now, is the Parli Commonwealth Parliament able to pass an ex post facto law? Yes. Under which case? Polukovic versus Commonwealth. Okay, now I have a question. So if we are saying that in the case of Polukovic versus uh, Commonwealth, the High Court has recognized the power of the Commonwealth Parliament to criminalize behavior uh, which was legal at the time it was committed. So the nature of an ex post facto law is that a, a, an act which was legal at the time that it was committed is now determined by the parliament to be, to be a crime. So imagine doing something today 
which could be, let's say, uh, well, not bestiality because that's a crime, but whatever that might be. Um, not reporting um, your extra income to Centrelink. Okay, so let's say not, that's right. So let's assume, let's assume that it's okay not to report your uh, extra income to um, to Centrelink, and you, because you've got an extra income from having students stay in your own house, and you need to report that income to uh, Centrelink. Now, subsequently, let's assume that the uh, uh, Commonwealth Parliament. Uh, pass legislation criminalizing that behavior. So that's ex post facto legislation. And let's assume that the Commonwealth Parliament did it as uh, part of part of a law, perhaps regulating um, interstate commerce or international commerce. So let's assume that there is a head of power uh, which uh, the Commonwealth Parliament could use to pass that specific legislation. So I'm focusing on the issue of ex post facto law. In this case, the example given by B, uh, not reporting an income to Sunday Link. At the time it was committed, which could have been 10 years ago, it was legal. Now it becomes criminal behavior. So that's, that is an example of an ex post facto law. The question I have is, would that law be legal? We assume that there is a head of power which the Commonwealth Parliament can use. Okay, we assume that. So let's not discuss that for now. Let's just focus on the question of ex post facto law. Would that be legal? Given the fact that you have the case of Polyukov, Polyukovic versus Commonwealth. There is no time uh, timestamp on the chat, so I don't know if what Brad indicated is an answer to the question that I have. Oh, Karen, you you raised your hand. Thank you. Um. Yeah. If, if we look at the uh, Justice, Chief Justice Mason's comments in yes. Polyukovic, yes. um, they said that the law, although retrospective in operation, provided it left it to the courts to determine mm. whether that person had engaged mm. in the, the offensive conduct, mm. then that um, was not an interference with the exercise of judicial power mm. and therefore it did not amount to a bill of attainder or mm. trial by legislature and therefore it uh, was a, a compliant law with the Constitution. So you think it would be legal? Yep. Don't you think that's kind of unfair? Well, in the absence of a bill of rights, the government can do it. Okay, interesting. Tiffany, I saw you raising your hand. Yeah, so did this come down to, um, in that case, that they said that at the time um, of Federation, the framers of the Constitution were aware that places like the US mm -hmm. had made it clear and had a clear position yes. um, in this regard. And so to not have it was a deliberate move. Mm -hmm. So therefore, they weren't willing to um, say right. that it that they weren't allowed, that kind of law wasn't allowed. That's right. So, and I haven't really gone back to the answer of Karen here, but that, that is correct. The reason why the uh, High Court determined that uh, ex post facto legislations were not necessarily proscribed or prohibited in Australia is that we don't have a Bill of Rights. And we could have had a Bill of Rights because at the time of Federation, the uh, framers of the Constitution were aware of the US Constitution. And in the US, under the US Constitution, ex post facto legislation is prohibited, it is proscribed. Okay, so we're clear about that. Any dissent to the answer of Karen? So Karen is saying it is legal, it is constitutional, any dissent. Do you all agree with Karen? I would disagree with Karen. Any dissent? Any dissent? I would disagree with the answer of Karen. Uh, actually, I, I mean, in principle, there's a gen, under common law presumption, there's a general uh, presumption that ex post facto laws would be legal. Mm. Um, uh, actually, actually, Ponya Talska was found not guilty, uh, and she was a test case for hundreds of other people. So they gave up trying to prosecute them mm. uh, after that case. Uh, but actually, I do agree with her that unfortunately, in this case, 
Poli Yukovic, they said at that time when the crime was committed, it wasn't a crime in Australia, but it was a crime where it was committed. It was a crime, would be a crime against humanity, against every, everywhere in the world. Uh -huh. And Australia, it was an area of concern to Australia. Okay. Because Australia was involved in the Second World War. I okay. think one of the other judges said that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I tried to read the case that's about yes. as far as I got. <laughs> yes. Um, before I respond to what uh, B said, I, I saw Tiffany and I saw Vanessa raising her hand. I would like to give the floor first to Vanessa. Vanessa, would you like to say something? Um, ordinarily, I suppose I'm going to be a hypocrite here. Ordinarily, I would say that I would not think it was right to convict someone of a crime that, or something of a crime that was today but wasn't at the time. Mm. But the fact that it is terrorism or you put it under that banner, I suppose um, perhaps there's a bit of fear mongering in that. That would make my, my instinct would be to say, well, that should be conduct that we find repugnant, let's legislate against it. But I guess the difficulty is that you can't assume that the parliament has understanding or has the foresight of certain situations they, as they evolve. So for example, if you talk, and this is gonna go down a different path, but if you talk about Syria, the people who were rebels at one stage, we, we to some extent supported, and perhaps the government has slightly changed position now, so we would say that that is terrorism. Mm. So it's very hard to say, well, at one stage we supported them, and at another stage, well, at a later stage, we change our position on it. Mm. So fundamentally, I would say, no, it's not right to legislate again or to make a crime illegal today when that conduct was not retrospectively um, finding someone guilty. But in this instance, the protection of the, of, um, the country and its citizens has to reign supreme. Okay. So that's why I'm being a hypocrite, in other words. Okay. Um, earlier, when I was using the word unfair, and uh, Vanessa kind of latched onto that because she then used the word, what was the description there? It didn't seem right to me. Now, yeah, it didn't seem right. Okay, those are not legal arguments, okay? I was just being flippant. But what is the legal argument to say that the com it would be unlawful, it would be unconstitutional, in fact, for the Commonwealth Parliament, as I would argue, that it would be unconstitutional for the Commonwealth Parliament to pass legislation, for example, criminalizing the act of failing to uh, report as income, you know, certain income, which at the time it was committed was legal, but then it became criminalized subsequently. So that's ex post facto law, notwithstanding Polyukovic versus Commonwealth. That's my question. I think I saw Nicholas Dyer uh, raising his hand. Hi, man, Joe. Thank you. I was just having a flick back through some of the Polyukovic judgment. Yes. There is some discussion in there regarding uh, bills of attainment and or, or ex post facto legislation and the imp uh, sort of impinging on judicial power of the of the chapter three courts mm -hmm. and I think one of the, the things that they got to with that was that if the law allows the court to decide on guilt in the matter then it, it won't come under it won't impinge on on the chapter three powers Mm. However, if it says you are guilty and must be punished, then that is where it would be unconstitutional and illegal. Very good. So in this case, the example I gave, it still leaves it. To, so thank you, uh, uh, Nicholas, because uh, you did uh, address the issue about Bill of Attainer, and we will go back to that in a short while. But the basic question I still have is, assuming that of, obviously it will be the Chapter 3 courts that will still have the power to determine criminal behavior or guilt, so the example I gave of the failure to report as income, if that was the subject of an ex post facto law, I argued, I said, that it would be unconstitutional. Is there anyone who can support me on that? Okay, so we're just gonna go through this quickly. You, we have to be careful about the case of Polyukovic versus Commonwealth. Okay, as pointed out by B correctly, in that judgment, the High Court did agree that the circumstances of the Polyukovic case, in particular the crimes against humanity, were of such a nature that they are the subject of universal condemnation by all civilized nations. And therefore, in that regard, it is a matter of concern even for Australia. 
Okay. So we need to examine that, that uh, high court decision within that context. It was a special case. Are we clear on that? In fact, if you look at the judgment, it was a four to three judgment of the high court. Now, we should be able to probably argue that that is an exceptional case and that most likely the high court will not tolerate just casually any ex post facto legislation because it can be argued that it is anathema to a democracy. If you have a democracy, it assumes that people have certain rights and freedoms. And it assumes, therefore, that these rights and freedoms cannot be casually taken away. If we say, therefore, that at the time that an act was committed, a person was free to do it, meaning it was not a crime, we're actually saying that on the basis of an ex post facto legislation, that freedom has, has just been taken away. So having said that, we have to be aware that the case of Polikovic versus the Commonwealth although it recognizes the validity of ex post facto law, we should see that as an exception to the rule. Okay? Now, what is crucial, however, for the case of Polyukovic versus Commonwealth is really the decision of the High Court that it is possible to criminalize behavior even if it is an act that, is, that was uh, committed abroad. That's the other aspect of the Polyukovic versus Commonwealth. So one is the ex post facto legislation, which we should see as an exception to the rule. The other really is the question of whether or not it's possible for uh, the Australian Parliament to criminalize behavior that, that was committed ab abroad. Okay, clear? Clear, okay, very good. Um, question two. So the Commonwealth Parliament passed the Anti-Corruption Act 2013. I'm aware of the time. I wonder if this is exactly the same thing. It probably is. Can we just skip this? If we have time, we'll go back to it. I think the answer is almost the same. So we're just going to go back to this if we have time, because I'm away at 6.38. Now, under the intimacy... No, no, no. Okay, hang on. Let's just go through that briefly, because I have a question which I wanted to... Uh... I'm just going to skip that. We're just going to go back to question one, which is kind of related to question two. Put it this way. Um, so let's assume that the Commonwealth Parliament uh, passed a law whereby um, it determined that membership in Jima Islamiyah uh, is a criminal act, even if such membership occurred while a person is abroad. Okay, so let me repeat. This is a new scenario, okay? So let's assume that the Commonwealth Parliament passed a law that criminalized membership in Jima Islamia, which, is, which it has considered to be, which it has defined and identified as a terrorist organization, okay? And so therefore the Commonwealth Parliament passed a, lo a law that criminalizes membership in Jima Islamia as a, uh, as a crime, whether such membership occurred both in Australia or abroad. Okay, question. What do you think about the constitutionality of such a law? Um, I think I would seek to sort of apply the Australian Communist Party as well mm -hmm. as the Adelaide Company of Jehovah Witnesses, uh, in which the High Court held that that kind of blanket rule is way too broad. Uh, it just um, uh, criminalizes an association without actually taking into account what that person has actually done or, or what were the teachings of an organization. Very good, B. So that constitutes a bill of attainder. Very good. And uh, I wonder, you know, very good. So fantastic, B. Very impressed. I'm very impressed. So uh, I raised that in the context of what if there is a... Uh, Commonwealth, the Commonwealth Parliament passes a law, because we've seen that happening in, 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 in uh, Queensland, okay? We've seen it happening in Queensland that membership, is it just a membership in the, um, more in, in the bikey gangs? Is that uh, a crime by itself? So we ask that question in that context, okay? Now, um, the Queensland legislation has obviously been recognized as being valid. It is constitutional mainly because um, 
there are fewer constraints on the power of state parliaments in general, unless they infringe on the powers of the, uh, the Commonwealth Parliament, which are exclusive to the Commonwealth Parliament, or they breach the, issue, the, the separation of powers, or perhaps if there are certain constitutional rights and freedoms. However, uh, yeah, that, that's right, Brad. Uh, there had been a problem. Yeah, so the Vicious Lawless Association Establishment Act is recognized as valid. And, but the question, if, if, if it was the Commonwealth Parliament that did it, as pointed out by, uh, correctly by B, you have the case of um, the Communist Party uh, versus Commonwealth, as well as the, the case of the Jehovah's Witness, uh, the Adelaide case as well, which uh, prohibits the passage of a bill of attainder by the Commonwealth Parliament. So a bill of attainder is a law which uh, identifies a specific person or group as having committed a crime on the basis alone of membership. Okay, and in that case, all you need to prove therefore is membership and it's not, the, it's not a specific act of having committed a crime. So that is a bill of attainder. And therefore, it's actually, it's actually an adjudication of guilt by the legislature. Because the legislature is saying, you are part of this group, therefore you are guilty. And that's, so in other words, it is no longer for the, for the courts to uh, adjudicate guilt. And that is, not, that is not permissible. Okay, so let's move on. So question three. Under the Intimacy Protection Act of 2009, Queensland, so this is a Queensland law. It is a crime for a person in Queensland to photograph or record or distribute, disseminate, or publish a photo, image, recording, or video of a sexually intimate act without the consent of the parties to the sexually intimate act. Mike Withers, a Queensland resident, was charged under the Intimacy Protection Act, Queensland, for distributing by email a video of Sheila Reynolds, a member of the Queensland State Legislature, engaging in an extramarital sexual act with a football player. Uh, Withers argues in his defense that this dissemination of the sexual video is constitutionally protected as part of his right to free speech and political communication advice, whether and whether a, his defense is likely to prosper. Volunteers. Okay, so B has defined the question, is, is the state, is state parliament able to pass the Intimacy Protection Act? That will be too broad. Um, that, would, that would be too broad uh, as a uh, legal issue, B. You need to connect it to a constitutional law principle because then you need to identify what the relevant rules are. So that's a bit too broad. Uh, but the state constitution doesn't have any limit to... Exactly, that's know. right. There's no, no, no problem with passing even, you know, um, ex post facto laws or bills of attainer or anything for uh -huh. the state. Is that true? Strictly the bills of attainer. <laughs> Is that true? I, I that there are actually no constraints on the power of uh, a state parliament to pass laws? Apart from, obviously, the issue of separation yeah, of powers. Yeah. Is that true? But isn't there a limitation on the power of the Commonwealth Parliament? I'm sorry, isn't there a limitation on the power of state parliaments? Are there limitations or not? We know that they're plenary and supreme within the state, right? But there are no limitations, is that what we're saying? So right, as Tiffany said, there is in fact a limitation. One of those is that they can't pass a law uh, if, for example, the Commonwealth Parliament has exclusive power uh, over it, or if the Commonwealth Parliament has passed a similar legislation. Because in case of an inconsistency between the state and the Commonwealth legislation, obviously, as we know, under the Constitution, Section 106, it will be the Commonwealth law that will govern. And to the extent of the inconsistency, the uh, state law will be invalidated. So we know that there is a limitation. What else are the other constraints or limitations on the powers of the state parliaments? Other constraints? 
truly. There are other concern, uh, constraints. What are those? Huh? Come on. Are we saying that the Commonwealth Parliament can pass any law? Come on. Comments? No, I, I, I got it somewhere, but I can't huh? remember where. But uh, I know there are some constraints. I know there's just some implied uh, freedoms that go with uh, representative uh, yes. government and, yeah, and that right. sort of thing. But there's no specific sort of section of the constitution, Very the good. constitution or anything like that. Yeah. So there is a limitation on the power of the state parliaments. That limitation is based on the Australian Commonwealth Constitution, which also controls the powers of the state parliaments. Okay, so let's just be, so in relation to this question, uh, moving on, in relation to this question, uh, what, what would you advise with this? What would you advise with this? Volunteers, come on. Okay, uh, come on, volunteers? Yes, Vanessa. Because this is specifically a criminal act uh -huh. or there's liability Yep. Um, under the act and that this would be considered a crime. Mm -hmm. His right to free speech and political communication don't actually enter into it. It's like saying I've got the right to kill someone because I oppose their idea. The two ID or these two IDs or these rights altogether are completely separate from the crime under the Intimacy Protection Act. So whether the, what the um, Sheila, her name is, whether she's an individual or a politician is really irrelevant to, to the crime because it has been defined as a crime. That's right. So, assuming that the Queensland Parliament passed a law that it would be a crime to burn the Australian flag, or it would be a crime to, to uh, say derogatory things against a state parliamentarian or a Commonwealth officer, because that has been defined as a crime by the, by the Queensland State Parliament, would you be saying therefore, Vanessa, that that would, that would be legal and constitutional? Sorry, can you just repeat that last part again, Andrew? So if following what you said, that yeah. because what you had said was that if it has been defined as a crime, therefore, it's not a question of, you know, political rights and freedoms. It's not about no. free speech and political communication. So I, I right. the second question now. If the, state, if the Queensland Parliament were to pass a law one, that it would be a crime to burn the Australian flag in Queensland, or two, it would be a crime to defame the, um, or to say bad things, or derogatory statements against the um, Australian Prime Minister, or any Commonwealth officer, or even any state officer, that it were a crime. Would you say, therefore, following your argument, that that would be legal and constitutional? Uh, broadly speaking, my instinct is to say yes, because it's a crime. It's not, um, it's not an infringement on anything of sorts. There's obviously liability, there are penalties and so on. And as long as the parliament has the power to pass these laws, then I would say yes, it is constitutional. Okay, I'll, I'll make another example, just for the purpose of making you think. The Queensland parliament passed a law which gave the uh, Queensland State Police, the power to enter homes, whether or not they had reasonable basis to suspect a crime had been committed. So let me repeat. The Queensland Parliament passed a law which gave authority to the Queensland Pol State Police to enter any home to determine if a crime has been committed, even in the absence of a reasonable basis for that suspicion, would that law be valid or constitutional? No, I would say unconstitutional because it infringes on your, the right to the sanctity of your home, your freedom within your property. 
Um, and it's not, there's no basis to it. So it's, it's open to be abused. This power is very discretionary. Mm. I kind of saw B shaking her head. Uh, sorry, I, I actually have two points. Uh, with regards to the latest one, I actually think the Queensland government can pass such a law, even though it infringes upon people's rights, as long as they do it in with irresistible clearness and very clear language so that they can be get punished in the next election, something like that. <laughs> but, but going back to this other question, uh, what she said earlier about the uh, this thing, I, I do believe that uh, because I just finished reading Lange and ABC, uh, that they said that there actually is an implied freedom of political communication across all levels, uh, state, uh, local, as well as federal level, because it was not possible to separate out the issues and an issue may affect both state, federal and local and one issue can cover all tiers of government and therefore there is actually an implied freedom of communication. Um, that, that's one thing to say bad things. You can insult the prime minister uh, about his policies and, and so on. However, in this question, I still think that with us is going to fail because I, you have to show that this picture of uh, Sheila Reynolds actually has something to do with political communication and uh, uh, that might not be so. Okay, thank you B. So I'm just gonna backtrack a bit to what um, B correctly pointed out, that the freedom of speech and political communication is an implied freedom or impl our implied freedoms, freedoms implied under the constitution. And these implied freedoms govern or act as constraints, not only on the powers of the Commonwealth Parliament, but also on the state parliaments. So let's, let, let's be clear about that. And that was the reason I gave you various examples, just to drive home the point that even the state parliaments, even if they may be supreme and plenary, but that's only in relation actually to, mainly to the separation of powers, but the state parliaments actually, uh, the powers of the state parliaments are actually curtailed by certain implied freedoms, including the freedom of speech and political communication. Okay, now, so let, let, we're clear about that. So my argument would be that in relation to this, there would be a, I would advise him that he has a defense because Sheila Reynolds is a member of the Queensland State Legislature. And as a, as a, as a member therefore of the Queensland State Legislature, she is uh, put to a higher standard of decency and morality and any of her acts, is subject to a political communication. If she commits certain acts which appear to be immoral, uh, which go against the decency of the state or of the, of the community, certainly that is a matter that is subject to political communication and debate. For, free, for people therefore to be proscribed from making a comment on that by then saying that it is illegal would actually be to diminish the power of people in relation to free speech. So I made that argument because Sheila Reynolds is a member of the Queensland State Legislature. So in other words, in the context of Australia, we do recognize that as part of the representative democracy that we have, so the notion of representative democracy, as pointed out um, in the cases in the High Court, tells us that there are certain rights that have to be implied under the Australian Constitution. I kind of saw the, the uh, Nicholas raising his hand. Yes, Nicholas. Yeah, sorry. Can I can I just have a little dissent against you here, Manjo? It's probably not yeah. a good thing. Exams coming up. Um, I've just been looking at the qualifications that someone would need uh, to be elected in Queensland. It's in the uh, Parliament of Queensland Act. And there's nothing in there at all about a person's moral character or anything like that. It talks about their their criminal history. It talks about their financial history. Um, you know, it talks about about crimes of uh, of uh, dishonesty and stuff like that and bankruptcy, but there's nothing about a person's moral fibre, which I think would make this a political communication. Okay. And then I think when you look at the ABC case and they talk about there being limits on freedoms of communication, particularly with regard to things that go to defame someone or uh, I won't go down that line too far, but you can't, I don't think you could, I don't think you could back uh, uh, with us for making a, a political uh, communication. Very good. That, that's a good point, uh, Nicholas, that you have raised. 
but we make a distinction between appointment uh, qualifications for elected positions or even appointed positions as opposed to the, the power or the freedom of a member of, of uh, citizens of a state to talk about political matters. That is, I have a class, it's my son. Um, there, is a, there is an implied freedom of free speech. Now, the crucial point there, Nicholas, it's a good point to say that, is that sometimes there is no open, you know, it's, it's not an open and shut case. It, it ultimately depends on the way you argue. For as long as your argument is persuasive, that would be fine. So in this regard, there is, you know, it's possible to, to argue a different position. So that's good. But, okay. but I would have to examine the way you made the argument. Um, can I yes, ask Brad. a question there, I guess, in support of Nicholas? Yes. Um, in the, the Australian Capital Television's case, it talks about um, being able to express your political views, mm. which which under 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 um, underpins what you know um, freedom of speech and the freedom of political right. views. That's right. But in this case, he hasn't expressed a political view. He's distributed an email and a video, mm. which which if that's gone to a third party, could then be potentially defi defamatory. <laughs> But what I'm getting at, he hasn't actually expressed a political view. He's just redistributed an email of which he, uh, an email of a video of the person. So he hasn't actually expressed his own political view. So that's what I'm trying is to work the, out. Is it the act of disseminating something, an expression of a political view? Well, that's why I'm asking the question, I guess. is. I mean, I would argue it is in the same manner <laughs> that when you burn the flag. That is an expression of a political view, even if you don't say anything. Well, there may well be, but then th this has implicated another person mm. without their consent. Mm. So thinking of the case from New Zealand of a video that was distributed, um, because we don't have privacy laws here. Yes. Um, I can't remember the case from a few, quite a few subjects back. Um, but that's what I'm trying to sort of break down as, whether, whether the issue is, has he expressed a political view mm. on one, That's or, right. or by just distributing an email, is that then considered an expression of your political view? That's right. So what we need to see, what we need to realize is that as far as expression of a political view is concerned, it does not have to mean making a statement as an oral statement or a written statement. For example, if you pass posters, if you wear a certain uniform to express a political view, the act of disseminating an email, these are actually uh, expressions of certain views. Even, you know, the putting up of a flag, that is an expression of an opinion without you saying anything or without you writing anything. And that would still be covered by the freedom of speech and political communication. And as I said, this is an area which can be open to debate. It all depends on how you make an argument. And my point was, because Sheila Reynolds is a state parliamentarian, I would argue that the act of disseminating that would, would be covered uh, by freedom of political communication and free speech. However, if Sheila Reynolds had been a private individual, it would have been different because there is no, uh, there, there, there is no longer any rationale for, such, for, for that material to be distributed. So a, a, a good example might be what if there were a video of uh, between two state between two state officers where they talked about bribing certain government officials and that type of um, a video because it would have been defamatory is actually also determined to be a crime would that be covered under the issue of uh, political free free uh, communication and free speech the answer is yes okay did you see the example i gave so there could be a video, there could be a law passed by the state parliament saying it is unlawful to disseminate videos uh, whose content can defame or destroy the reputation of any person, in, including politicians. And it happens that there is a video, an incriminating video, between two state officers or between a state officer and a citizen where they talk about corruption or even the killing of a person. Would it be criminal? Would a person likely be uh, charged for a crime under that law if he then disseminates the video? My answer would be no. 
he would be covered by the freedom of speech and political communication. That scenario, I would argue, applies as well to this case of Sheila Reynolds because she is a state parliamentarian. The only difference is the context. One is a sexual uh, video. Yes, B. No, no, so sorry. So what will happen if I actually, you can see on my posting that I actually tried to sit on the fence and I said the whole matter hinged on whether uh, this video is considered to be a political no, statement. No, 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 no. That, no you that, can't that say do. that. That won't do. You no. need a statement whether or not you think that, that that is an expression of a political opinion. It's not for the ju You can't say it's up to the judges. It's actually up to you. You, are, you will be forced to state an opinion whether or not you think that is covered by freedom of speech. Okay. It's seven o'clock. Do you want to continue? Uh, Major, I just got a quick question. Yes, Vanessa. There's, for the previous one, what if, if I was to play devil's advocate, what if this video was with um, Sheila Reynolds' husband and not this, you know, random perhaps football player? So it was just a sexual act between Sheila Reynolds and her husband. Ah. If that makes sense. So in actual fact, there's nothing immoral about that, that if that makes different. sense. That would, be that would be different. That would be different. Absolutely. Okay, there, there's no, you know, what, what, what good is it to society to publish or, or circulate a sexual recording of, be, between couples doing, you know, who are, who are married or um, who are in a partnership? There is, there's nothing there. I doubt it. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Okay, so moving on. Um, okay, see you later, Brad. Thanks. Final question. This is actually a long, um, the answer to this one is quite long. So we're just gonna have to go through this quickly. Um, are you happy to proceed? It's 7.03. I mean, those who feel like they need to go, um, feel free to go. For those who wanna stay on, we will stay on to cover question four. Acting on the basis of evidence gathered from a surveillance, the police arrested and detained Nick Frostman under the Broad Border Protection Security Act 2010 Commonwealth, an act passed to combat domestic and overseas terrorism. After the police refused to release Frostman, after his 12th day of continuing detention, Frostman seeks to challenge the legality of the act and his detention. Advice Frostman on whether his legal challenge is likely to prosper. Volunteers. So if you have to go, feel free to drop out. Uh, I would understand it's past seven. Okay, so from Tiffany here, the first issue of course is to determine what under what head of power the Commonwealth Parliament can pass this law. What's the answer to that? Uh, Tiffany, do you have an answer to that? Um, yeah, I would say under the defense. Yes. Um, and then you'd have to consider whether we were in war or peace time. Mm -hmm. um, Any other head of power? What are actions? Overseas terrorism, external affairs. External affairs. B, what is this about the exe executive power? Reading about it in section 61, they yeah. sometimes talk about it, yeah. So does the executive actually have the power in relation to this in the sense that on its own, it can determine that a person is a threat to the freedoms or security of the state and therefore arrest that person? Does the... Um, no, no, I guess that would be an exercise of judicial power, but it has... You're asking whether he has got a head of power to pass this legislation. So yeah. this is the head of power for the yeah. legislation. Uh, we haven't got to the part where they have arrested Nick yet. Yeah, yeah. So when you speak of the head of power, I'm just clarifying B. When you speak of the head of power, we always talk in the context of the power of the Commonwealth Parliament, not of the executive. Now, we speak of the executive power in the context of administrative law, like the power of the executive to enter into contracts, the power to... Um, uh, the power to, uh, to enter into treaties, uh, the power, for example, to detain boat refugees. You don't need uh, in, an enabling law from the parliament to do that. Okay, but that's distinct. That's distinct. Uh, 
let's not confuse that with the head of power in the context of the Commonwealth Parliament. Okay, so the executive does have certain inherent powers uh, or residual powers to do certain things. But in relation to this, the, because this is an act of the Commonwealth Parliament, the, the question, the relevant question really only is whether there is a head of power that could be cited by the Commonwealth Parliament to pass this legislation. And uh, as correctly pointed out by both B and um, Tiffany, yes, you can cite both the Defense and External Affairs and from Nicholas, Postal, Telephonic, and other like services. I agree. I agree with those. Good. So having said that, having said that, um, so we know that there's a head of power. The question then is, assuming that there's a head of power, can the common parliament pass this law? So B is shaking her, ah, is saying yes, nodding her head. So B, you think it's, it's legal? How about the others? Do you agree it's legal? What, are, what, if, what if the law says that, that the police can detain um, Frostman for a period of 60 days? Would it make a difference? A good point here pointed out by Karen. Is he an Australian citizen? We're going to go back to that. Fantastic, Karen. We're going to get back to that. Um, I, 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 I had it actually in my answer that the, the length of time was actually uh, quite relevant. Okay. Uh, because it is, it is legitimate to, in order to arrest someone and process them, uh, yes. investigate and so yes. on. Uh, but you can't obviously hold someone indefinitely. Uh -huh. uh, it has to, uh, you cannot imprison someone without charging them with a crime because imprisoning, depriving people of freedom is a punitive act uh, that's reserved for judicial, uh, after judicial decision. Uh, but it is okay to, to hold them for a certain period of time. So that I was quite hung up on the 12 days, whether Very 12 good. days was a lot or a little. So what freedom is that B? Freedom from arbitrary detention, as pointed out by Tiffany. Very good. What case are we signing here? What's the relevant case? Not what was Lim Chu Lim Chu case? Chuk. Chuk is a chicken. Chuk Lim, Lim. Uh, I'm Lim. Chuk's in my house, by the way. Chuking Chuking Lim. Chuking Lim, yes. Very good. Okay, so there is a freedom of from arbitrary detention, which again is a recognized constitutional right. Okay, so that's crucial because it could be about the police just stopping you and then detaining you for whatever reason. There is a freedom from arbitrary detention. What we need to know is when we speak of arbitrary detention under U.S. constitutional law, the mere fact that you have been stopped is already an instance of a detention. So there has to be a justification for that. Okay, so I'm just clarifying that because you might think that detention necessarily means that you have to go to the uh, police station. The, the mere stopping of a person can actually be argued as an act of detention because you have been detained. Your, your freedom of movement has been curtailed or has been, has been uh, constrained. Okay, now, um, Karen pointed out, asked the question, so uh, having, having said that, as pointed out by B, there, there might be an argument, there might be a difference whether the detention is for 12 days as opposed to 60 days. That's a good point. So I would argue that if it's 12 days, um, it's probably a protective measure. And so therefore, therefore, if a person like Frostman were to be detained for 12 days, it would only be for the process of determining whether or not a crime, uh, whether or not a charge could be, uh, he could be charged with a crime or it could simply be to protect the state. So arguably, it is not a punishment. There, because if it is a punishment, it has to be curial, meaning it has to be done by a, a court. But on the other hand, if it were for a period of 60 days, that would most likely, arguably, be uh, an act of uh, a punishment, which means that uh, it will unlikely to be valid if it is for a period of 60 days. Because you can no longer argue that it's for protection it's for, if we, or if it's for the purpose of determining whether that person can be indicted. Okay, so you make a distinction. Now, having said that, Karen raised a relevant point by asking whether or not Frostman is 
a uh, is a is a is an Australian citizen. Why does it matter? Uh, sorry, B, I, I'm not able to read what you've uh, stated here because I'm I'm kind of uh, engaging with the others here. Why does it matter? Does it matter whether or not Frostman is a citizen or not? As pointed out, as asked by um, Karen here, does it matter? It's relevant insofar as it'll be more difficult to verify his identity. Okay. Let's assume that Frostman is an alien. He's actually an Englishman, or he's actually a Syrian, or he's actually a Kiwi. Does it matter? What do you think? Does it matter? Look at the case of the boat refugees. Are they being detained in those, well, we call them detention centers, I think. Let's assume we don't call them detention centers. We call them processing centers. So a lot of these boat refugees from Iran, Syria, Afghanistan, where, and you know a lot of other um, Middle Eastern countries, and even Asian countries, I suppose. Like, it could be Afghanistan, sorry, Afghanistan um, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. So let's assume that you have those, and Indonesia. So let's assume that they have the, you have those boat refugees. They are detained in the processing centers of Australia offshore. And a lot of them, some of them have been there for years, haven't they? So is that constitutional? Is that legal? How? Why? So therefore, going back to the question of whether or not it makes a difference whether the person involved is a, an Australian citizen or an alien. Not really an Australian citizen, but an Australian subject. So, because an Australian permanent resident is also covered under the protection of, um, as, I, as I will show later on. So it's not just an Australian citizen, it's also an Australian subject. Meaning there is a valid visa. So in, in other words, if a person has a valid visa in Australia, he has certain other rights that others may not have. Maybe perhaps an alien, which brings back my question. Would it make a difference between a person who, who has a valid visa in Australia or is an Australian citizen as opposed to somebody who is an alien? Answer, what do you think? I'm thinking about the boat refugee problem. Come in. Volunteers. I think it would make um, a huge difference, but I also think the Department of Immigration and Border Protection would probably cancel your visa <laughs> upon sus suspicion anyway, to be honest. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I, w I wanted to say in that in that case of Chu King Lim and the Minister mm. for Immigration, they actually ruled that he was held uh, illegally, but unlawfully. But they reversed their position in the next case with the Minister of you know, what, Indigenous Multicultural Affairs, the and Lam, the other the other case. Um, they actually reversed their decision and said that uh, it was okay to detain these people because they could not be allowed to enter the country. So um, what are you going to do if you don't hold them? Where are you going to put them? Um, you know, so it, I guess that, that was kind Very of their good. argument. Hang on. I think some of you should, do, are you aware that there is an LLB honors program for CK Uni? Some of you, I hope, should join that program. B, you should be teaching constitutional law. You're ready for it. Huh? So that's correct. Um, B was correct in that regard. Uh, in particular, the case of Alcatel versus Goodwin uh, establishes the rule that um, aliens uh, may actually be detained indefinitely. It is legal to detain them indefinitely. And in that case, uh, it, it is not an act of punishment, but it is a protective measure for Australia because it cannot just allow. Uh, aliens to enter into Australia. Okay, so you make a distinction. If citizens, there's a question of the reasonable period of time when they are detained. If a person is an alien, meaning somebody who is not an Aussie citizen or somebody who does not have a valid 
visa to remain or stay in Australia. They are uh, subject to fewer rights. In fact, uh, the courts have recognized that they may be indefinitely uh, detained if there is a valid basis for doing so. Okay, so I think we're done there. Questions before we end tonight's session? Would anyone want to stay on to talk about his or her um, legal memorandum? Or we could do it on Monday. Uh, B, you want to do it tonight? I don't have to do it tonight, but I actually just have one question, uh, if you want to finish. Um, it's, it's actually about part B of the assignment. Uh, whether if you, if you, the thing is that if you assess yourself wrongly, which obviously I assess myself wrongly, does that mean you get zero because you didn't accurately predict the mark that you were going to get? No, 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 no. You don't get a zero for that. You don't get a zero, did you? It could have been a mistake. We don't, we don't give zero to anyone. I don't know. But, I, but, I don't. I don't know, but no, I don't know because I don't get a breakdown on my mark, which was why I put my paper up to. I think I have the answer for you. Yeah, Tiffany. I think I have the answer. Um, when you with mine, I don't know if yours did this, but with mine, um, there's like the breakdown of the mark for the first part, and that's like the issue rule and whatever, and it doesn't have on there the assessment, uh, like the your own review assessment. But if you go down to the bottom of the document, are you opening it in like Adobe where it's there's the little blue comment bubbles and you can click into them? There should be one. You there. know, maybe I, I should try that again because I tried clicking on different parts of I've forgotten <laughs> Hard to go, so I have to click, click on some blue bubbles. Yeah, yeah. yeah so what happened to me, because this happened to me when I like first started, so you have to actually go to a, the Adobe website and download the latest version. And then when that happens, what you can do is you can open the document, and then when you open the document, there'll be little annotated notes that the mark has given you. Mm -hmm. And in one of those notes down the bottom is a breakdown of the mark. That's right. But you have to, yeah, download Adobe. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Because I saw that for my learning diary last time, last term. Mm -hmm. But I, 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 I tried clicking. All I got was I got back my old Word document again, but there was actually nothing on it. There were no comments on nothing on it. I've had a few yeah. students as well sending me an email about that, but eventually they sorted it out. So obviously it's there. Um, they had just a technical problem or a problem finding out how to do it. You may want to look into that again. Oh, the other one, sorry to jump in B. Also what you can do is if you're not clicking the little pen on grade mark, so do you, when you go in, when you see you like the turn it in, right? And you go to turn it in and there's the document, right next to it's a little pen and you have to click the little pen to bring it all up as well. Mm. Okay, uh, okay, thanks. I'll try that because I did go into the turn it in document as well. Um, uh, I'll, I'll try it. Thanks. Okay. So thanks. Thanks a lot. And um, so that's the end of our discussion of the first 12, the 11 topics uh, in this course. And the next uh, tutorial we have will be a revision. And I'm very happy to uh, see the same faces in a sense. I'm happy that, you know, you're here. Although would have been happier had there been more phases coming into these tutorials. Would there be any other questions? Uh so Monday is at 6 p.m. or? Yes. 6 to 7. Uh, that's going to be uh, for a, uh, it's a learning session, a kind of an informal review of um, legal memorandums. Okay, and then we'll have the tutorial on Tuesday, not on Thursday because I'll be in Sydney, I'm not available for another university event. So we're going to do the tutorial on Tuesday of next week. So we're good. So thank you everyone. And uh, to those who did really well, Tiffany among them, Tiffany got an HD, didn't you? Was it 39? 37. 37. Yeah, very few had that. Well done. And Thank to the you. others, you know, very, very, there were only nine people out of 162 who had HDs. And only eight people had distinctions. This was, I'm surprised, a difficult assessment. I actually thought it was easier because one of them was actually a giveaway answer. And I gave students an opportunity to choose. So I'm surprised why the, the, the quality of the answers wasn't what I expected. 
So to those who did really well, um, congratulations uh, to, the, to the others. You know, put in more effort, I'm sure you'll make it. Okay, so thank you everyone and I hope to see you on other Monday or Tuesday of next week. Good night, bye.